one of my most favorite books. It's written by a Methodist minister named Leslie Weatherhead. You may not have heard of him. He served as pastor of City Temple in London during the time of World War II. And while there, caring for his congregation, he was asked time and time again about the perils of war and about God's intervening in the war and about the suffering that war causes in the hearts and lives of others. And so he prepared a series of sermons, five of them, in fact, and this, these sermons were collected into this book. The book is called The Will of God. That's a question we all ponder, isn't it? We ponder, where is God in all this? What is happening in the midst of our lives, in the midst of the world? What is going on, and when and when and where is God going to intervene? We want to know, is it God's will? Is it God's will that these things should unfold? And so we ponder and we worry and we question. In his sermons, Leslie Weatherhead identified three components of God's will. The first is God's intentional will. God's intention for all creation. And we can go back to our stories of creation in the garden where God created everything to be in harmony with one another, to be in harmony with God himself, where the people and the creatures that God created could walk freely and to live in union with one another. This was God's intention for us. This is God's intentional will for all of the creatures including humans that God created. And yet we know the story. We know that sin entered into God's good creation. And therefore, God's will shifted to be a will of circumstance. Leslie Weatherhead calls this God's circumstantial will, where God works in the midst of our circumstances to care for us, to show up, to give us the strength we need, to invite us into community with brothers and sisters in the faith, the gifts and the blessings that God bestows on us are part of God's circumstantial will in our lives. Bad things are going to happen. Creation is broken. The world groans in pain. And God is here at work in it all. And as God works in the midst of our circumstances, God works to bring, about, to bring about God's ultimate will. God's ultimate will, which for God, and thanks be to God, is a return to God's intention, where all can live in harmony and in unity, in community and love without fear, without sadness or tears. And so Leslie Weatherhead identified these three components of God's will. God's intentional will, God's circumstantial will, and God's ultimate will, the return and restoration. And so from this we see that God acts in the middle of things. God shows up in the middle of whatever is happening in our lives and takes action, takes action. In our Isaiah text for today, the Jewish people have returned to Jerusalem after being exiled to Babylon. They've been away from Jerusalem for decades, in captivity, living in hostile territory, being put to work by the Babylonians, being a part of their community and not able to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as they desired. And the further we are from God's presence, God's place, the further we are from the community of God's people, the harder it is to be faithful, to be a part of that faith that God has given to us. And so they've returned now to Jerusalem. 
And as they've returned to Jerusalem, they're trying to figure out again how to live with each other, how to tap into the faith that God has given to them, how to restore the community of God's people in that place and in the temple. And so here the psalmist, the prophet Isaiah, cries out in a prayer on behalf of the people, Come again, God, into our presence. Take action in the midst of everything that's happening, just as you did long ago when you came into our presence through Moses, when you handed to us the Ten Commandments and you gave to us the desire and the ways to live in community. Isaiah cries out the longing of God's people to come back, to forgive their iniquity, to make his presence known in their midst and to restore them to the love that God has for them. And in so doing, Isaiah reminds the Lord of that relationship that the Lord established with them. Isaiah says, remember the time of old when you were our God and we were your people? Do you remember, O Lord, how much you loved us? Remember, O Lord, that you are the potter and we are the clay. Create once more your people. Make us faithful. Gather us into the bosom of your love. Be our God. And remember that we are yours. Forgive us. Restore us. We too cry out for God's presence, don't we? In the midst of our own circumstances, we cry out for God to make God's presence known to us, to remember how much God loves us when we've gone astray, when we think we're unlovable, when we think we failed completely. We cry out for God to remember, to be faithful. And Paul writes to the church at Corinth that declarative sentence, God is faithful. Three words that maybe we all need to hang everywhere in our home so we can see them. Because it's not about our faith. It's about God's faith. God's love for us is what unites us in the community and gathers us to be God's people. Because we are going to fail. And God is going to respond in love, in mercy, in compassion. Not because of what we do, but because of God's faithfulness alone. And so as we live our lives in the here and now, in the waiting place, as we live our lives waiting, knowing that we are a people who know the story of God's coming, Catherine is so right in that we know Jesus comes as a baby. We know that story. We celebrate it each year as we move towards Christmas Eve and the nativity of Christ's birth but we also know the rest of the story. We know how Jesus' life comes to an end, and we know that God raises Jesus from the dead. And so we live in the already of God's coming as Christ, but we also live as people waiting for God's intentional, for God's ultimate will to be restored to God's intention. We wait and we cry out in this season of Advent, come, Lord Jesus, come. And we're not crying out for the little baby in a wonderful, cute manger surrounded by animals and hay and the sweet little Mary and the wonderful Joseph. Yes, we remember that image and we'll tell that story. But in the season of Advent, we cry out for the return of Jesus. We cry out for God's ultimate will to be done in our lives and in creation so that there is no more death, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. We cry out, come, Lord Jesus, come. 
Come, Lord Jesus, come. Living in the already and the not yet, we wonder how it is we survive in the midst of our circumstances. And Jesus tells us to keep awake. Keep awake. Meaning, don't become complacent in waiting for the Lord Jesus. Wake up each morning and cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Restore creation to the goodness you intend for us. Gather with God's people. Be God's people out in the world, calling the world to welcome the coming of our Lord. We keep awake. We don't fall into slumber and to complacency. We keep awake knowing that Christ is coming. We do not know when or how, but we know it is happening because Christ comes among us each day in the midst of our circumstances. And Christ comes among us now as we gather as God's people. Christ comes among us in the water, the life force, the giving, the living in the water. Christ comes Christ comes among us in the bread and wine that we taste. And Christ comes among us as we go forth, being God's people in the waiting place of God's love. Amen. Amen.